Great musician Eric Clapton, who suffered extreme pain when he lost his four-year-old son after falling from the 49th floor, made his fans heartbroken when talking about his tragic life. Eric's memories from childhood to adulthood are filled with negative things that still haven't gone away. In this video, we will reveal Eric Clapton's entire tragic journey of nearly 80 years. Let's follow along. In the early years of his life, Eric Clapton, who would later become one of the world's most celebrated celebrities, lived in what he believed was a typical family setup. He had what seemed like two relatively elderly parents and an older sister named Patricia. However, Eric's understanding of his family dynamics dramatically shifted during his preteen years, as reported by The Independent. It was then that he learned the startling truth that his parents were not actually his biological parents, and his sister Patricia was, in fact, his birth mother. This revelation was a profound shock to the young Eric, especially as it coincided with his entry into puberty, a time already marked by significant personal change and confusion. The backstory of this family secret is both unique and somewhat tumultuous. Patricia, who Eric thought was his sister, had become pregnant with him when she was just 16 years old. This occurred after a chance encounter with a Canadian serviceman named Edward Fryer, who was stationed in England during World War II. It's important to note that Eric never had the opportunity to meet his biological father. Edward Fryer, the Canadian serviceman in question, passed away from cancer in 1985, leaving a trail of offspring from various relationships. After his service in the military, Fryer's life took an unconventional turn. He became a drifter and earned a living by playing the piano in various bars. This nomadic and seemingly elusive lifestyle of Eric's biological father contributed to the emotional struggles that Clapton faced throughout his life. According to an article in the Ottawa Citizen, one of Eric Clapton's most poignant songs, My Father's Eyes, was inspired by this deep-seated longing for a paternal connection that he could never experience. In the song, Eric candidly expressed his feelings, saying, I never met my father, and I realized that the closest I ever came to looking into my father's eyes was when I looked into my son's eyes. The profound family revelations that young Eric Clapton experienced had a significant and lasting impact on his life, reshaping his personality and setting him on a path that would ultimately make him one of the most iconic figures in the world of music. As detailed in Bob Gullah's book, Guitar Gods, the 25 Players Who Made Rock History, Clapton's response to these revelations was deeply emotional and transformative. Before learning the truth about his family, Clapton had always been introverted and reserved. However, upon discovering that his parents were actually his grandparents and that his sister was his biological mother, a dramatic change swept over him. He became moody and distant, reflecting the emotional turmoil he was experiencing. This personal turmoil also took a toll on his academic performance as his grades began to drop, showing the significant impact of the family revelation on his young mind. Despite these challenges, one aspect of Eric Clapton's life remained constant and would ultimately become a pivotal factor in his journey. At the age of 13, he had a transformative encounter with music that would change the course of his life. While watching Jerry Lee Lewis perform Great Balls of Fire on television, he was mesmerized by the electrifying sight and sounds of the performance. This experience ignited a passion for music within him. For his upcoming birthday, Eric made an unusual request. He asked for a guitar. Initially, the instrument proved to be intimidating, and he found it painful and difficult to play. However, Eric's determination to master the guitar prevailed. As he began attending art school, he decided to give the guitar another chance. It was there that he developed a profound love for the blues scene, particularly the blues music originating from across the pond in the United States. This newfound fascination with the blues became a driving force in his life, and he dedicated himself to learning and playing the guitar. With relentless practice and unwavering commitment, 
Playing the guitar soon evolved from being a pastime to becoming his primary hobby. Eric Clapton's journey into the world of music took a decisive turn as he became increasingly immersed in his passion for the guitar. His dedication to music began to overshadow his interest in art school, and as a result, his academic performance suffered. According to Bob Gulla, Clapton's commitment to art school dwindled to the point where he started turning in very little work, ultimately leading to his expulsion. However, by this time, Clapton had wholeheartedly embraced his identity as a guitar enthusiast, and he didn't mind parting ways with the academic environment. To make ends meet and support himself financially, Clapton took on a daytime job working for his grandfather. During the evenings, he pursued his true passion by doing what any young aspiring musician would do. He joined a band. His first venture into the world of music came with a group called The Roosters, but this initial foray proved to be short-lived, lasting less than a year. Shortly after The Roosters disbanded, Clapton reconnected with an old friend from art school, Keith Relf, and began discussing music with fellow blues enthusiast Paul Samwell Smith. These connections led Clapton to new and exciting opportunities in the music world. He soon found himself playing the guitar as a member of the Yardbirds, a popular band that skillfully blended American blues with British rock influences. During his 18-month tenure with the Yardbirds, Clapton and the band followed in the footsteps of the Rolling Stones, even securing a residency at the same Crawdaddy Club where the Stones had previously performed. This period marked the early stages of Clapton's rise to fame as his exceptional guitar skills garnered him a growing fan base. After leaving the Yardbirds, Clapton embarked on a new musical journey by becoming the lead guitarist for John Mayall's Blues Breakers, a highly influential blues band. By this point, Clapton's reputation had grown to such an extent that an anonymous fan spray-painted the phrase, Clapton is God, on a wall, a declaration that would go on to become a legendary meme in music history. In 1966, Clapton took another pivotal step in his career by teaming up with Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce to form Cream, a British rock power trio. Cream rapidly gained worldwide fame and acclaim for its distinctive blend of blues and rock, solidifying Clapton's status as a musical icon and making a lasting impact on the world of music. Eric Clapton's life, despite his musical success, was marred by personal pain and addiction. His rise to stardom in the 1960s brought not only fame, but also a growing dependence on heroin. During this period, he formed a close friendship with George Harrison of the Beatles. However, this friendship took a turbulent turn when Clapton developed an intense infatuation with Harrison's wife, Patty Boyd. Clapton's unrequited love for Boyd was so profound that it became a source of inspiration for some of his most famous songs, including Layla and Wonderful Tonight. Boyd, in a later interview with Rolling Stone, revealed the extent of the turmoil that erupted between Clapton and Harrison. It all began when Clapton, in a drunken confession, admitted to Harrison that he was in love with Patty. This revelation understandably caused a serious rift in their friendship. The situation escalated to the point where both Clapton and Harrison engaged in a somewhat bizarre rock duel for Patty Boyd's affections. Despite the intense competition, Boyd remained committed to her husband and refused to leave him. This period of emotional turmoil and rivalry took a toll on Clapton, and he continued to struggle with his heroin addiction, sinking deeper into the abyss for three long years. The love triangle and substance abuse issues painted a complex and challenging chapter in Clapton's life, revealing the darker side of fame and success. Patty Boyd's decision to reject Eric Clapton earlier in their relationship was primarily due to his heroin addiction, which had become a crippling issue in his life. However, as her marriage to George Harrison deteriorated, partly due to Harrison's infidelity, a pivotal moment occurred in Clapton's life. He managed to break free from his heroin dependency. 
During this time, with Harrison's permission, Boyd and Clapton unexpectedly found themselves in a romantic relationship. Five years after this unexpected turn of events, they eventually got married. Unfortunately, their marriage didn't live up to the paradise Clapton had envisioned, largely due to three significant issues. First, although Clapton had conquered his heroin addiction, he had replaced it with another formidable foe, alcohol. He was consuming two bottles of brandy every day, and his sobriety was far from complete. Second, both Clapton and Boyd desired to have children, but faced the heartbreaking challenge of being unable to conceive. This created an emotional strain on their relationship. The final and perhaps most devastating blow was Clapton's infidelity. In 1986, he had an affair with Italian model Lori Del Santo, and to make matters worse, he revealed to Boyd that Del Santo was now pregnant with his child. Around the same time, he also had an affair with Yvonne Kelly, a studio assistant, who became pregnant with a daughter named Ruth. This latter pregnancy was kept a secret for many years. These betrayals shattered their relationship, and it was no surprise that Boyd decided to leave Clapton. She eventually pursued a career as a travel photographer, seeking a new path in life away from the tumultuous and painful relationship with the legendary musician. Eric Clapton's struggle with substance abuse was more severe than one might initially realize. According to NPR, at the height of his addiction, Clapton was spending a staggering $16,000 on heroin every week. When he transitioned from heroin to alcohol, accompanied by frequent cocaine binges, he still refused to acknowledge the full extent of his addictive tendencies. This led to shocking moments, such as being so intoxicated during a performance that he had to lie down on stage because he was incapable of standing. In 2007, Clapton reflected on this embarrassing incident, admitting, The thing about that kind of addiction that's pretty funny, on reflection, is that I always thought, I'm handling this. I can handle it. I can stop any time. I just don't want to stop right now. However, a significant turning point occurred in Clapton's life in 1986. Lori Del Santo gave birth to their son, Connor. The experience of becoming a father profoundly affected Clapton, especially considering the absence of his own father during his upbringing. He was determined not to subject his son to the same hardships he had endured and resolved not to allow Connor to witness him in a drunken state. This commitment required Clapton to endure extended periods of sobriety, which proved to be a painful but necessary sacrifice. By the following year, Clapton finally came to the realization that he needed professional treatment for his addiction. He made the decision to check into rehab, marking a critical turning point in his life. Since then, Clapton has remained sober, demonstrating a remarkable transformation in his struggle with substance abuse. The birth of his son, Connor, played a crucial role in Eric Clapton's recovery from addiction. However, just a few years later, Clapton faced the most tragic and heart-wrenching event of his life. In 1991, as reported by the New York Times, Clapton's four-year-old son, Connor, tragically darted past a housekeeper, ran through an open window, and fell 49 stories to his death. Clapton was in New York at the time, and the night before the accident, he had taken Connor to the circus. In his autobiography, he recounted the surreal moment when he walked down Park Avenue, desperately trying to convince himself that everything was still okay. He was grappling with the disbelief that such a terrible mistake could happen. Even after seeing the police and paramedics on the street and identifying Connor's lifeless body, he remained in shock and denial. The loss of his son left Clapton understandably traumatized. In his grief, Clapton channeled his intense emotions into his music. He created a significant piece that would become one of his most iconic songs, Tears in Heaven. This heartfelt and melancholic song was born out of his pain and the deep sorrow he felt after Connor's tragic accident. Eric Clapton's ill-fated four-year-old son is the crystallization of him and Lori Del Santo. 
Lori Del Santo's life has been marked by both tragedy and hope. She craddles her newborn baby boy, Lauren, with a fleeting smile that briefly touches her glazed and sorrowful eyes. The memory of her four-year-old son, Connor, who fell 53 floors to his death through an open window in a New York skyscraper, still haunts her, as if the tragedy happened only yesterday. Has been nine years since that fateful day, and for Lori, the pain remains fresh. However, Lauren's birth has brought a glimmer of light back into her life, providing her with the strength to speak about the senseless tragedy that had devastated her. Lori's early life was marked by challenges. She was born into a strict Italian Catholic family as the second daughter. Her father passed away at a young age, leaving her mother to work long hours to support her family. Her hope was to see her daughters secure jobs in a nearby bank or school. However, Lori had bigger dreams. At the age of 20, she left for Rome to pursue a career in modeling and TV presenting. She quickly gained fame in Italy as the glamorous girlfriend of a prominent businessman. Moving to Milan, she continued her TV career and also ventured into photography. Her life took an unexpected turn when she started attending pop concerts and was invited to dinner with a group of friends, where she met Eric Clapton. Initially, Lori didn't recognize Clapton, but found him to be natural, relaxed, and uncomplicated. Their first dinner led to a gradual and cautious relationship. Lori was reluctant to become involved with a famous person for a fleeting affair. She had a deep desire for a serious, committed relationship with a man with whom she could have a family. Over time, Eric's persistence and sincerity gave her the confidence to take their relationship further. It developed slowly, with Lori refraining from asking too many questions or imposing demands. She wanted to keep things light and enjoyable. One day, Eric surprised her with a phone call, announcing that he was in Milan. When Lori inquired why, he responded, Because I love you. This marked a turning point in their relationship, as Clapton's declaration of love signified a commitment that Lori had longed for. Eric Clapton's personal life was in turmoil as his marriage to Patty Boyd, whom he had taken from Beatle George Harrison, was coming to an end after nine years of being together. Clapton's history of numerous affairs had taken its toll on their relationship. During this turbulent period, Lori Del Santo got to know Clapton more intimately, and she began to witness the darker aspects of the recovering heroin addict's personality. While she never saw him use drugs, it became apparent that Clapton had developed a problem with alcohol. At first, it was difficult to discern because he would drink throughout the day without displaying the typical signs of drunkenness. It was at a club where he became abusive that Lori realized the severity of his drinking issue. She recognized that he was drinking not for enjoyment, but purely to become intoxicated. Clapton's struggles were rooted in his mental and emotional battles. Although Laurie was not well-versed in alcoholism at the time, she noticed his willingness to quit. Clapton's approach to overcoming his alcohol problem involved extended absences from Laurie, lasting up to a month at a time, during which he would return having abstained from alcohol, drinking only water. This pattern repeated itself with periods of sobriety, followed by relapses. Lori did her best to support him, setting a good example and assisting him when he asked for help. She even attended Alcoholics Anonymous, AA meetings with him, offering her presence and silence when necessary. The most challenging aspect of their relationship during this period was the extended silence that Clapton required. He sought total silence and needed to live in an environment devoid of noise. Lori rarely heard him play the guitar or sing in their house except for the occasional time when he sang Happy Birthday to her over the phone. Clapton would enter into periods of silence that lasted for days, even weeks. Gradually, he would begin to communicate with a few words a day, building up to a couple of sentences. Lori respected his need for silence, and she would wait for him to initiate conversation during these times. Despite the difficulties, Clapton would eventually break the silence with something profound and beautiful, making up for all the quiet moments. 
Their relationship was a complex interplay of silences, words, and unspoken understanding between them as they navigated the challenges of his alcoholism and emotional turmoil. Several months after Lori Del Santo and Eric Clapton had met and were enjoying a particularly communicative period in their relationship, they broached the topic of having a baby. Clapton's failure to have a child with his former wife, Patty, had been one of the contributing factors to their marriage falling apart. So, when Clapton asked Lori what she was thinking one day, she expressed her desire to have a child. Clapton's response was one of delight and alignment. I said I wanted a baby. He said, oh, me too. I said, really? Because I couldn't believe it. Then he said, are you really, really serious? Because if you are, let's do it. Their decision to start a family took shape in September, and by December, Lori was already pregnant. She recalled feeling dreadfully sick during a Christmas Day dinner at Clapton's manager's house. Others assumed it was due to her not liking the English food, but she later discovered it was a result of her pregnancy. Her happiness knew no bounds, but Clapton's reaction was quite different. He entered a dark mood when she shared the news. Despite Clapton's initial response, Lori was overjoyed and nothing could dampen her spirits for the following two days. She had been living in London with Clapton and commuting back to Milan for work. This period was challenging for Clapton as he had recently moved from his country home, where he had been living with his wife, to a townhouse in London. He despised the traffic and noise in the city, which affected him profoundly. He had doubts about his past, present, and future, and the impending arrival of their baby disrupted his well-organized, simple life. Lori, however, was convinced that Clapton had wanted the baby more than anything else. It took Clapton about six months to fully adjust to the idea of becoming a father. During this time, Laurie decided to distance herself from him, feeling that he needed space to sort through his feelings. She didn't want anything from him and returned to her life in Italy without even planning to call him. Clapton's entourage, however, played a role in sowing doubts and misunderstandings. When they learned of Lori's pregnancy, they warned Clapton that she might try to use it as leverage to get things from him. Lori was hurt by these assumptions, as she had always been honest, proud, and self-sufficient, even covering her own expenses, including plane tickets to see him. Clapton began to doubt her intentions as well, and Lori decided to let him reflect on his own. She knew that some things couldn't be fought for, especially if they weren't meant to be. After three months, Clapton's manager contacted Lori and attempted to convince her to end the pregnancy. Lori stood firm in her decision, asserting her independence and principles. She made it clear that she was not just a piece of meat without a mind or values. The decision to have a baby was one they had made together and she was resolute in her commitment to seeing it through despite the challenges and external pressures. After she became pregnant, a shocking incident occurred when Clapton attempted suicide by hanging himself from a tree. Lori was devastated and felt a mixture of anger and sadness. She couldn't comprehend how Clapton, who had a family to look forward to, could contemplate suicide. She believed life was too precious to be wasted in such a manner. Their relationship continued to be tumultuous, with Clapton making sporadic appearances. During one phone call, he asked about Lori's well-being but didn't mention the baby. She didn't bring it up either, and they had a brief conversation before he disappeared again for two months. During these periods of absence, Clapton wrote Lori a heartfelt letter expressing his love for her and his desire for their baby. It was a source of comfort for her. One day, Clapton asked if she had read the letter, and when she confirmed that she had, he insisted on coming over for dinner. The dinner was wonderful, and Lori was hopeful that Clapton had realized the importance of their child. However, she later noticed that the letter had vanished, and it was the only evidence of his commitment to their baby. Clapton reappeared when Lori was eight months pregnant. He played a more active role in preparing for the birth, arranging a muse house in Chelsea, and visiting Lori daily. When Lori went into labor, he was present and even entered the delivery room. 
It was a moment of realization for him when he exclaimed, Oh my God, I'm a father. After Clapton returned from a holiday, they started living as a family. Clapton initially wanted Lori, Patty, and himself to live under one roof, but Patty refused. They lived in the countryside for a while, and Clapton seemed happy, enjoying a period of sobriety. However, as Connor grew, Clapton struggled with the demands of fatherhood. The mess and the absence of the silence he craved disrupted his previously ordered and simple life. Clapton didn't actively engage with Connor, treating him as if they were worlds apart. Lori hoped that he would eventually adjust. But after three years, she decided she couldn't wait any longer. She desired another child, but Clapton was too insecure to commit. They went their separate ways, only meeting occasionally so Clapton could see Connor. Tragically, the day before their son Connor's death in March 1991 had been one of the happiest in their lives. Connor had spent a joyful day with Eric at the circus on Long Island. Eric returned filled with happiness and declared that he now understood the meaning of being a father. He expressed his eagerness to take care of Connor on his own without any help. He wanted to cook for him, wash him, and be the sole caretaker. Lori was delighted and asked if he was sure, to which Eric insisted. He had finally grasped the essence of fatherhood. However, fate took a cruel turn the very next day when Connor tragically passed away. Eric Clapton's life has seen significant improvements in the past few decades, following a history marked by rocky relationships, addiction, and personal tragedies. Since 2002, he has been happily married to an American woman named Melia McInerney as reported by USA Today. Their life together has provided him with a newfound sense of stability. Clapton and Melia have welcomed three children, all girls, into their family. In 2013, his oldest daughter, Ruth, shared a picture of her newborn baby, Isaac Eric Owen Bartlett, on Twitter. This marked a new chapter in Clapton's life as he officially became a grandfather. In recent years, Eric Clapton, despite finding stability in his family life, has faced a new set of challenges in the form of health difficulties. In 2016, he publicly disclosed that he had been diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy, a condition often referred to as the musician's fear due to its debilitating symptoms, which include numbness, shooting pains, and a lack of coordination. Notably, Clapton's neuropathy primarily affects his legs rather than his hands. This led to speculation that his ailment might have been a result of his years of alcohol abuse rather than the physical strain of performing music. In addition to peripheral neuropathy, Clapton also had to grapple with hearing loss, another harsh reality that confronts many musicians who have spent their lives in the industry. These health issues were undoubtedly challenging for a musician of Clapton's caliber. Despite the daunting health diagnoses, Clapton maintained a realistic perspective on his future. He acknowledged that this particular condition I'm living with isn't necessarily going to get better. However, he didn't express intentions of retiring from music. Music has been a cornerstone in Clapton's life, helping him navigate through numerous trials, and he remained committed to continuing his musical journey for as long as he could, even if it meant slowing down on major public performances. His enduring love for music and his determination to keep going serve as a testament to his resilience and unwavering passion for the art form that has defined much of his life. What do you think about the tragedies that happened in Eric Clapton's life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.